Good morning, my name is Andres Lucht. I'm from Dekema and will guide you today through the session for the transformation of the process industry with my colleague Ange Fehling. Uh, we start Hello? We start today's session with smart plant processes. And the first presentation for today is why does digital transformation frequently fail in companies? Digitalization is not technology topic. So, sounds pretty exciting. Um, speakers will be Andreas Schumacher and Moritz Wollenschlegel from VTU Top. Thank you very much. All right. Hello, everybody. Really pleased to be here today, um, me and my colleague, with the topic, why does digitalization fail? So today we want to pass this hype a little and talk about, well, we know it's important, we know we all need it, but why doesn't it work all the time? Myself, I'm Andreas Schumacher. I'm from VTU. I'm heading our strategy and digitalization as well as digitalization strategy. We are in seven countries in Europe, about 1,300 people, and we plan and build large facilities in the process industry. Moritz? My name is Moritz Wulschläger. I'm head of automation and industrial digitalization here at VTU. Um, I'm based in, in Basel and responsible especially for automation and digitalization project at our customers. Perfect, thank you. So we have quite an extensive background in digitalization. We have seen many digitalization projects in different companies, being the service industry, but mostly the process and other industries. And I always start with my favorite saying about megatrends as well as digitalization. It is like an avalanche in slow motion. We all think we have a lot of decisions and time until we have to actually make a decision. We saw this with the COVID crisis. Those companies that actually managed to have their people ready for going to home office, they were fine. The other ones in 2020, when we got the message, you all stay at home now, they got overrun by this first avalanche of digitalization just four years ago. And now we have another one. It is AI. And I have the feeling when I look into the industry that most of the companies, they're still at the stage where they say, well, we do have time to decide. We can basically go a bit left and right of this avalanche, but I'm 100% sure it will be another avalanche where we have to think about what to do now and not two to three years later. And this increasing speed of digitalization, it doesn't matter which curve you are looking at. All the curves are getting steeper and steeper. It's being the adaption rates of new technologies, ChatGPT, 100 million users in two months. It being transistors and their sizes of microchips. It being data created, we're now in the SETA byte area. So all these curves go upwards. What does this mean for us? It means long five years digitalization strategies and roadmaps, they don't work anymore. Because if we start a long project in this less steep area of these curves you see on the screen, by the end, we are already in a steeper path of this curve. So we need to think quicker. We need to make smaller strategies. And today we want to talk about basically, let's assume you already have a strategy. Let's assume you already know what you want to do in digitalization. And about 60% of companies don't know if you look at recent service. But let's assume you do know. Still, 7 out of 10 digitalization projects fail. So people assess, we did a project, but we're not happy with the results. It was a large McKinsey study that revealed that over several industries, including the process industry. So we did reach a bit of a draft of delusionment. We all know the garden hype cycle. We all thought Industry 4.0 will be a big promise to bring value creation back to Europe, but promises were not always held. So now we do not have all connected um, shop floors and connected equipment. And so we're all a bit critical of digitalization. And today, we want to look past this hype. We know it is important, but we want to talk about why doesn't it work sometimes and maybe give you one or the other tip how it can be done better and how less of these projects fail. We will provide you nine mistakes that we see commonly over all different industries, over all different companies, and we will urge you to go through your own digitalization projects and maybe some of them will resonate with you. All right. Moritz, hand yeah. over to you. 
Let's start with the first mistake. You get a digitalization project just driven by technology. You feel like, yeah, we, ne we need robotics because Gartner just released a new hype cycle and we have to uh, fulfill all those different topics written on the hype cycle. So basically, what we, what we have seen in the past is that technology-driven uh, digitalization often fails. You really have to think about how can we adapt those technology advancements for ourselves, for our business, for our use case, and not the other way around. Because it will immediately fail, or you just have a digitalization project which could be done perfectly. It's implemented 100%, um, fulfills every single KPI you've driven, but nobody uses it because you didn't have any processes um, adapt to these new technologies. It's just you're doing quite the same without doing something else now. So there's no advancement for your business in general, just looking at new technologies and implementing technologies and technologies and technologies. Be Let's make an example from um, who really thought about the, the Copilot in the first place. I mean, everyone's hyped about Microsoft Copilot, but did it change really the, the, the processes within the, the companies using Copilot? I mean, the technology implementation is not like the different, the different, uh, the, the difficult thing here, because it could be implemented with, let's say, three clicks from the from your IT manager. So that's not the problem. The problem is the people adapting to those new technologies. How to solve this? Start with your business and not with the technology. Think about how could you implement such things like a co-pilot. What do you want to achieve with such implementations? And this is also true for, for manufacturing um, facilities. Like, what technology really drives your efficiency ahead? All right, thanks, Moritz. Second mistake we constantly see is your portfolio. Usually, there's two mistakes you can make. You can either listen to your board, all the vision you have, everything you want to do in your company, the big ideas, these major ideas of being AI-driven, being fully data-driven, having a fully digital work experience. This is coming from the top, usually. And then you have all your employees, they all have wishes on the shop floor, where to store their data, how to find information, having the wrong information stored somewhere. And usually these two developments, they're pushing your portfolio. And the mistakes you can make is either you listen only to what's coming from the top down, which means you start five, six, seven major initiatives. Problem you run into is there is nothing visible. In the first year, if you start with a data warehouse, if you say, now we structure our data, and now we get better with reporting in our company, there is nothing visible in the first six months. Or you can make the other mistake. You have all your colleagues coming to you, and they all ask for help for fixing some of their problems, for smaller wishes, for sometimes bigger wishes. And then you always say, yeah, let's do it. That sounds like a really great idea. And then you run after many, many small initiatives, but you're not really moving the whole company. And so it's a, it's a rule of thumb, but I found this to be true in the last 10 years in most of the companies I saw. Define three major initiatives, for example, being a data-driven company, building a data warehouse, building some business intelligence and dashboards, or being a paperless company, because this will take you years to implement. And in the first year, nothing will be seen. And then define 10 to 20 small initiatives, very small things. And then think about what initiatives target the most of the people in their daily lives. And it can be tiny. It can be a holiday application. It can be some scan on the shop floor that before had to be a paper that is filled out. Because this is visible to everybody. And so if you combine these two into one portfolio, you make sure you please the major initiatives, you really move your company, you transform it, but in the background mostly, mostly in the back office, and then you have these small initiatives that everybody can see, but where nobody would say, wow, this is really groundbreaking, but it's important to the people that actually want to see what's happening. All right, back to you, Moritz. Mistake number three. You have uh, the wrong project focus. What we often see is that you focus really on the technology part. It's kind of linked to the, the mistake number one. 
now you have um, found a really nice use case, and the project just is determined by the, the technology, uh, technology guys. But you have a management guy, um, people you, you should really rely on within those projects. You really have to get the, the operators within the kind of project, especially in operating business. When we do software engineering projects, the biggest mistake was to not talk to the operators, especially for um, retrofit projects, whereas you have a, a plant producing for the last 40, 50 years, and now you want to change like the, the distributed control system. They have so much knowledge, and hidden knowledge you do not gain from, for the, for, um, from their like, standard operating procedures. It's just not written down. You have to talk to the people and how they, how they would change like, little, little things within, within the, um, the new procedures, with the new DCS, and not just kind of my, make the same mistakes again we did like, or people did 50 years ago. So the digital champions, which are um, companies or digital, uh, digital project teams, it's like a variation. It's a, a multidisciplinary project team where everyone has like kind of the same, the same reasoning, the same idea about the project, and not just the technology guys from the, from the digital department driving some crazy technology within your company. This is the, like the sentence, run the project with the people that really matters. The digitalization guy, like, <laughs> like we are, we, cannot, we do not know in the first place about your business. You know. And it's really, really important to get your knowledge within these this, this projects. Because we can do the, technolo uh, the technological part. And as I said before, that's not that hard. The much harder part is to gain your insights and really work on the project together. Just the next one. Yeah, it's good. Oh. <laughs> Mistake number four. Um, neglecting the digitalization in the CAPEX projects. Nowadays, um, I'm coming from automation and systems engineering. So today, we are with digitalization um, at the stage where automation has been 20 years before. It was like, yeah, we, we have to focus on the process, on the plans, on the, on the infrastructure, but the automation guys, like they're coming last. Just, just don't talk about it. They, they, will, they will run their business. And nowadays, the automation part is like really helping defining like a user requirement specification. We're already in it. But now we see the digitalization part is like, meh, that's not interesting to us. That's the, the whole other department. Often we see like in the, the CAPEX projects, the digitalization and the ITOT parts are separated. They're not included within the, those bigger CAPEX projects. And there are many like um, loopholes there because it's really, really hard to do the digitalization part after implementing a CAPEX project. Even it takes more time and it takes a lot more money. So if you include in the initiatives the digitalization part within your CAPEX projects, you will have a much easier life on them because you already included it. And to be honest, 100 people working on a CAPEX project, you might get two people working for the digitalization part as well, fitting in those kind of projects. If you need those digitalization people after you've done with the CAPEX project, you might need a team of 10 or 20 people just working on um, the digitalization part. All right, thanks, Moritz. Um, what we see again and again and again, and this is really important, is the project team. Because usually what we say, well, digitalization is a technology topic, so we need the tech guys to run it. We need the tech guys in the project team. I'll give you an example. At VTU, we have a digital work project. We implement a digital work cockpit for all our employees. The project is headed by a psychologist. 
because we have to think about how people are using the technologies that we provide them. And I come back to this iceberg model. We usually focus our project teams in digitalization on this 10% that you can see in red. But we don't think about what other people do I need in my team. And usually, the project shouldn't be stuff with tech people. It doesn't matter how technologically advanced the project is. You need experts, two, three really advanced people that understand data, technology, and the process related to it. The rest has to be people that can run a project. Legal advice, process advice, GDPR advice, digital work advice. And usually I see project teams in industrial companies, especially a meeting room, 16 people, and 14 out of the 16 are tech people. And this is exactly what these two funnels are showing. We are focusing 10% of what we want to see on 90% of the project team. But if you look at the iceberg, actually, it should be the other way around, no? It should be a social science topic, not a technology topic. Technology is easy. Technology you can buy, you can implement. But you have to think about how to train your people, how to get your legal department involved, how to get the social science part right. And then, the project team must be stuffed the other way around. But usually when you're a project company and say, we need 90% non-tech people in this project, they would say, are you crazy? It's a tech project, so we need IT and OT, etc." All right. Additional mistakes. These were some in more detail. I give you some more that we constantly see in the last 10, 15 years. Missing financial impact, visible financial impact. It is really hard to assess the benefit of digitalization. It's a bit easier when you talk about manufacturing, material, less equipment, then it's easier. But I want to see the person that can really assess me the financial impact of increased data quality. How do you put a, a price tag on that? How do you assess that for your board to make a decision? So digitalization usually is turned down in companies because of a missing business case, of a missing P&L impact for digitalization. And so please do not start with a huge business case to assess the whole life cycle of your solution. Start with a very simple assessment with five to 10 qualitative questions. Why does it make sense? Because that's a really good basis for deciding, are we going to stage two or three with this project or not? Do the, the intense business case later on. Don't start with the huge business case. Too many questions that are not needed at the beginning, usually. Project manager has the word manager in its job title. Usually, we see very often that digitalization projects are not managed by project managers. It's usually IT, OT, or some kind of operations person that is involved. But it is a management position. It should not be headed by IT, OT people, because they do usually not have the management competencies. One of my favorite ones, um, usually when we do a digitalization project, Internally at VTU, we make the same mistake. We're not perfect in our company. We do the project, digital workplace, and then we think, now it's done. Now this thing runs. Nothing to do anymore. The mistake we make is we really neglect the effort for operations. We had a project team of 15 people to implement this cockpit. We still have three to four people that run this digital cockpit. So digitalization is like every other CapEx project, like any other equipment. It needs somebody to run it and improve it. Otherwise, you will have a problem after one year. And what we see is usually the consultant comes in, the project is done, and then it should run by itself. That's not the case. Digitalization is an asset like every other equipment. It needs operation and people to run it. And last but not least, apps and software. We at VTU, we have around 200 software tools, and I constantly get requests for new tools. Because these tools are seen as the fix to the problem. I have a problem, I go on Google, I research something, well, this is better than Microsoft Visio, this should, could be used to visualize the process. And people think, oh, it's, it's the quick fix. So my recommendation is think about the workflow behind it. Don't think about the software solution. Put the software solution last. You should instead Google how to improve an accounting process, how to improve a manufacturing process, and then work from that. We saw this before with the business problems. No? Start with the problem and then think about the solution, because this will reduce your number of new apps and new software tools that are actually just an enabler. They are not solving any problem by themselves just because you have them. They only solve a problem if you optimize the process before. So 
Conclusion from about 20 years of digitalization consulting in different areas, there is no magic dust. And I'm not getting tired to repeat that because we always think there is this one approach to digitalization that not 70% of my projects fail. But that's really not the case. This doesn't exist. It's hard work like every other project. But our request is think about technology. We at VTU, we are doing technology. We are doing process, but always treat digitalization more as a social science topic and not a technology topic. And then you see the last line written there. If you and your companies try to avoid just a few of these mistakes that are on these slides there, you will avoid having these 70% failed digitalization projects. All right, thanks a lot for listening, guys. Um, please visit us at, at, at our booth. Um, let's have a drink, let's eat something, let's talk about failed or successful digitalization projects. I'm very interested to hear how you do it. Um, what is your issues and challenges that you have and maybe also some tips for us. We always want to learn and improve, so I would be very interested in that. All right, thanks for everything, Moritz. Are there any questions? We have room for, for questions. We do have a bit of time for questions, if there is some. First of all, thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Moritz, for the presentation. And yeah, are there some questions? Everything clear? Ah, uh, no, no. <laughs> Hi. Thanks a lot. Very interesting. What was your most successful project so far? I mean, <laughs> you can comment on that. <laughs> it, was a, it was a digital work project headed by the psychologist. It was, it was interesting because the first three months, our uh, IT people were quite disappointed about the project because we spent a lot of time thinking about how do you structure digital work in a company? How are people thinking? What are the layers they have to go through to see information? And so our IT team was saying, well, there is nothing happening. We're spending a lot of money and time, but I don't see any results. And then month four or five, it really started peaking up. And then the IT people suddenly said, all right, now let's start moving. And we really didn't discuss any concept again, any strategy, anything we decided because it was all decided. And so this was successful because in the end we never looked back and questioned ourselves, we just went to the future. And so this quarter that we invested basically on strategy was really successful. And that made it a quite successful project overall, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you for the for for the very nice um, po uh, slides. Uh, in in one of your slides, you have this um, uh, iceberg um, uh, model. Yes. Where you also place the change management management thirty percent. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to um, know a bit more details regarding how you handle this change management yeah. uh, in the project execution and uh, yeah. Where do you get the knowledge and also maybe competence for, for this kind of change management issues? No. Yeah. Thanks. There, there, there's two, question, two answers to this question, basically. So change management starts with the first 10% of your project. You, you have to talk to the people that actually carry out digitalization and operations and ask them what they need, what they want, how they work. It's about acknowledgement, it's about consideration, it's about listening to them, and not come top down and say, we got a consultant from external, they told us to implement this, and this makes the most sense. This is where it starts already. It starts with asking the people what they need, and this is quite an exhaustive part that you have to do, because it takes a lot of time to talk to these people and ask everybody what is your wishes for the solution, and then combine it, come back and present it to them, and then be questioned again if this is the right approach. So this is where it starts. And then it's about constant communication. Like what I see very often is this one magical email that we are now changing something and now you use this new tool, this new equipment, this new software. This is now how it goes. It's about being part in each of these meetings, talking to the people. And there is not this one town hall meeting how you can roll out this solution. So I spend about 60, 70% of my time just talking to people. I'm not really talking about the technical part, but just how they feel, what they do. And this is why I'm always saying it's more a social science topic. And there's also not one method that, that works for everybody, but it's uh, some like to watch videos about what you do, some like to listen to you. It's also a generational topic. And then another, the second answer to your question is 
make the steps quite small. Don't wait until you have a lot built because you're proud that we got a lot done. It's better, in my opinion, to communicate the smaller steps. Because it's like in church. Now, if you say something a hundred times, you start really listening. If you say it only two, three times, nobody still listens. And so this is a bit the, the approach that, that we go for. But once again, there is no golden path to it. Maybe, maybe uh, just in the project rules, yeah, who is mainly driving for this uh, change management and uh, who is taking care of this kind of aspects? Yeah. No? We at VTU, we have a digitalization department that is only taking care of digital solutions and change management that goes with it. And we work together with the managers from all departments and with HR. And for each digitalization project, we think about how, what steps do we need to do to change the behavior of people? Do we need trainings or not? If it's a small solution, it might go without a training. If it's a bigger solution, it requires a training. But this has to be defined for each single project. The 10 to 20 and the three major ones that we had, each separately. But we drive it with, digital, with the digitalization department in our company, also our customers, yeah. All right. Yeah. What helps a lot is also the project team on the digitalization part. Um, We've seen like if you just put in managers and leaders, um, it's like a top-down, a top-down project. So, but if you, in in every company, there are people like driving changes. They're coming up with ideas from bottom up. Like, can we do this? Can we do that? If you can identify those key people and get them into your digitalization team, they like spreading the word. Like, hey, that's cool. That's that they're spreading to your, their, your colleagues. And that's really easy then for you as a project manager because you're not doing the hard work. Like, the cultural change is happening almost um, by itself. So that's like a key thing we, um, we've seen in, in retrofit projects as well. So it's really hard to change the mindset or the processes um, from 50 years in, immediately. But if you have like the driven people on your team, they just, they just get the, the team up with them. And you don't have to, have, the, have to do the heavy lifting. All right. So talking about the process industries, are there some operators here? So you see, there is a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Ah, I asked if there are some operators here. No. Uh, well then, is there a question from your side for the audience? Because we still would have some time. If not, we would hand over for the next speaker. Maybe, maybe a quick poll. I would like to ask you guys, um, would you agree with the number that we saw with the 70%? If you think about your internal projects, also something you see maybe at your customers, do 70% or more fail? Or, 70, or less than 70 fields. So for everybody that believes about seven out of 10 of our projects or more fail, please raise your hand. All right. It's interesting because I think it is a lot about what you perceive as failure. It's a hard number to believe that seven out of 10 projects would really fail. So I'm always questioning service and studies, um, but it's a good eye catcher to talk about it. So I think the discussion also needs to be a bit about what is the expectations towards these projects, because usually they're too high, and then you might assess a project as a failure. But in this case, I think your expectations are not too high, because only five, six people raised their hands, but it's the average. So about 50% should reach their hands here. All right, thanks, yeah. Yeah, thank you then, Moritz, Andreas. All right, thank you. thanks very much.